Hello, I'm Robert Horton, member of the National Society of Film Critics and the Programmer Historian in Residence at Scarecrow Video. And I'm happy to say that in the fall of 2021, I'm once again leading the Scarecrow Academy, an online discussion group presented by the nonprofit Scarecrow Video in Seattle. Our series is a continuation of the art in noir, film noir and the director, it's part two, presenting noir with an emphasis on the art of the film director. You don't have to have attended any previous sessions in order to join us this week. The series is free, takes place uh, via Zoom on Saturday afternoons at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Go to the Scarecrow Academy page. Uh, you may be there already. There'll be a link to click on and Scarecrow will email you with uh, instructions about how to join us for our Zoom meetings. Our next meeting takes place on Saturday, November 6th for a discussion of Robert Altman's 1973 neo-noir. A long goodbye. I will introduce the director and the film now. Let's start with a word about neo-noir and its distance from classic film noir. Okay, think about the time span between the long, uh, b between Kiss Me Deadly, which a lot of folks think is a, a good sort of rounding off point for the classical period of the original noir, to the long goodbye. That's 1955, Kiss Me Deadly, to 1973, The Long Goodbye. 18 years. If we look back 18 years from the moment I am recording this message, we're talking about 2003, which somehow doesn't seem as long a distance uh, as the time span between 1955 and 1973, despite the admitted tumult of recent years here. Uh, somehow the cultural changes from the, the, the 50s to the 70s feel gargantuan, I guess. Um, I suppose every generation thinks that, uh, but the, the events of that span seem especially huge. The private eye uh, figure in those two films uh, provides a measuring point, I think, for the, the distance that we're talking about. It's not as though Kiss Me Deadly itself were, were sort of an old school film noir, uh, classical. It's not, it's not really even classical itself. In the, let's say, dozen or so years since the very beginnings of film noir to uh, Kiss Me Deadly, you already see a shift, a shift that takes us uh, roughly from the very classical form that you might see in a pre-noir like, um, uh, let's say, the Maltese Falcon, certainly from Double Indemnity in 1944, to a, a more modernist form, which shows its true colors in, in Kiss Me Deadly. Simplistically, uh, the, the, the classical form of art tends to bring us a balanced argument, the sense of a protagonist or two that we follow through a story and and a, a rise and fall to a, a story that um, provides catharsis. There's, there's a beginning, middle, and an end, and the classical film executes a, a theme with a, a series of scenes that answer the questions that are posed at the beginning of the story uh, and, and provides explanations for the actions of, of its characters. The modernist style does not believe in those kinds of um, rounded off scenarios and forms. In, in fact, halfway through this time span that we're talking about, 5573, you've got uh, Jean Le Godard coming coming along, the the, the great uh, French New Wave director, and declaring uh, a movie must have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. So in the film noir, we move away from um, stories that that have this con conventional rise and fall at the beginning, in, in in which questions are answered, in which the moral order is restored at the end, and then you come to the sort of fragmented world of Kiss Me Deadly, for instance, which provides no explanation for the big what's it. Uh, in that movie's uh, plotline, um, we, we, we do sort of find out what it is in a way, but uh, not, not how we got here or how it got here or, or what it means or what it will be used for. Nor does that movie provide order at the end of the film. Quite the opposite, in fact, you might say that a, a world in which uh, even the atom can be split and uh, in which the story is similarly fractured with terrible consequences, uh, how can any center hold together any longer? Thus you get the many images of Mike Hammer in that film moving through a labyrinth as he circles and circles uh, toward a solution that is that turns out to be worse than, than not having solved the case uh, would have been. And as we saw in the film that we watched in our series last week, Point Blank, the image of a labyrinth gets replaced by uh, some kind of exploded jigsaw puzzle uh, that exists in fragments that are frequently out of order, uh, many of which may not even be real. Remember too that in The Killing, which we watched a couple of weeks ago in our, our semester, um, it, 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 that film explicitly cites the jigsaw puzzle in its, in its uh, dialogue as a referential 
or, or perhaps self-referential description of its own design. So by the time we arrive at the long goodbye in 1973, titanic social upheavals have happened in the previous 20 years. Film noir has been discovered by critics and audiences as a distinct genre. The future filmmaker Paul Schrader uh, published his, his article, a very famous article about film noir in Film Comment in 1972. And just at that moment of profound disillusionment, you also had this, this nostalgia craze that took over America there in the early 1970s, as though to retreat to a, a kind of nicer, simpler time. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that actually on Saturday, setting up the long goodbye. So it makes sense that at that moment, people, uh, people at movie studios, let's say, would want to revisit those, those noir films of the 1940s and 1950s. And someone at a studio might say, hey, let, you know, let's do a Raymond Chandler novel at the time is right. And indeed they did that in, in various places. But when they brought The Long Goodbye to the director, Robert Altman, that pretty much guaranteed that the project would not be an exercise in nostalgia. Uh, for no American filmmaker is less nostalgic or sentimental than Robert Altman. Altman was already demolishing the cherished traditions of classical Hollywood cinema in the 1970s with a string of movies that, that really make him, I think, the American filmmaker of the decade. It was called revisionism at the time, and Altman was not the only director uh, at this trade, but he was probably the most visible and the most energetic. Altman was born in 1925, uh, grew up in Kansas City, was a bomber pilot during World War II, flew over 50 missions, I think it was, and got involved in industrial filmmaking and other kinds of commercial filmmaking in Kansas City after the War. So actually, he was already in his 40s uh, when, when he broke through with a, with a box office hit, uh, a, a film called MASH, uh, 1970, as I said, uh, which was a huge hit, especially with the counterculture. Um, uh, his success partly came by mocking the conventions of the war movie. And of course, by, by being wildly uh, committed to the absurdity of war, popular theme at the time of Vietnam. The movie, of course, was ostensibly set in the Korean War, but nobody who would go to see it at the time would have doubted that it was a commentary about Vietnam. By the way, uh, in, in sharp contrast to the TV series of MASH that would follow uh, a couple of years later during the 70s, Altman's movie really is incredibly bitter, uh, it, although it is comedy and very funny one, uh, and, and actually quite cruel uh, in its tone and, and even toward its, its characters. He quickly turned the Western genre inside out with an extraordinary film, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, about a year later, which undercut many of the traditions of the Western film, yet managed to create a new kind of mythology of its own in a way. In turning to The Long Goodbye, Altman was, was openly intending to deal kind of a fatal blow to the private eye movie, uh, to rip apart its cherished conventions. And the movie is, is sarcastic and self-conscious with an ending that would not have been acceptable 30 years earlier, um, or, or even at the time of Kiss Me Deadly, I think. But it very much fits the disenchanted mood of 1973. Um, and we should say that this ending, I won't say what it is, uh, some of you may not have seen the film yet, but uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. And it was suggested by the screenwriter, Lee Brackett, in her draft of adapting the, the Chandler novel, which she wrote even before Altman came onto the project. And what, what happened was that uh, Altman made uh, keeping her ending a part of his contract in making the film. Brackett, uh, had, by the way, had been a screenwriter on, on The Big Sleep, another Chandler adaptation in the 1940s. Howard Hawks is a very, very popular um, detective movie. And so she, she spans both these eras that we're sort of talking about. And she would also, uh, she worked on other films for Howard Hawks and of course would also write the screenplay for a little movie called The Empire Strikes Back before she died. So Altman's revisions take a number of different forms in this film. The, the, the clockwork mechanism of the traditional detective story, pretty much dismantled by the very first, very long sequence in this movie, The Long Goodbye, in which the private eye searches for cat food for his hungry pet. Altman also told his cinematographer, cinematographer Vilnos Zygmunt, that he wanted the camera to be in constant motion, as though prowling around or looking for clues. And I think um, I, on Saturday, I wanna talk about how that is a, a, a difference from the traditional approach to the conventional private eye movie. There's a whole complicated stylistic thing I wanna talk about. 
they also decided to flash the negative, as it's called, a technical term, to, to let in more light into the image and to capture the, the Southern California sun in all its decadence. Even the casting of the film is highly subversive. Instead of the obvious choice of the time, someone like Robert Mitchum, who, who did ma make some private eye movies during this, this decade. Elliot Gould, the star of MASH, was cast in um, uh, this role. He made, had made a series of sort of anti-establishment films already at this time. He seems very nearly the anti-Philip Marlowe at, at first glance. He's got his, his shambling gait and, and mumbling delivery and, and seeming indifference that he projects. Perhaps he's the last person anybody reading the, the books would, would picture as Philip Marlowe. And yet, in a weird way, he makes it his own. And we want to talk about that on Saturday. I also want to really talk in detail about the cast of this film. It, it is a re remarkable group that Alban uh, assembled here, and it's key to the film in some ways. And, and, and in fact, casting and working with actors uh, is a large part of Altman's directing energy in all of his films. Altman said he thought of the director as a painter or musician rather than a storyteller. And I think you can see that in this movie uh, in abundance. And uh, he, he does take apart conventions. And yet, I think finally, we may, we may see that The Long Goodbye is a strangely beautiful film on its own terms. During our session, we'll also talk about the movie's strong sense of betrayal, which befits the uh, subject of uh, or the, the time of 1973. It's experiments in sound, which is something Altman was already being celebrated for, uh, even at this time. And uh, generally, to talk about how, how far this movie gets from classical noir. And I will also share uh, the story of the one time that I observed Robert Altman on a film set. So please join us Saturday, November 6th for a conversation about Robert Altman's neo-noir, The Long Goodbye.